Um, I'm alive. So we're, we're going to, you guys can watch this again. Really? Yeah. It's a rerun. You know, you don't get enough of this class. You can watch it again. What about Tuesday? Tuesday. Tuesday. I'm going to try to bring my camera every day. So every day that I remember. Last Tuesday, I did not record it, but I'm going to try to post my recording from last semester there. So I'll, I'll do that. So I'll post an announcement there. All right, so let's see here. We can see. All right, so we're going to post. Um, this is going to be chapter nine, which is experiments. Wait, is, are you, is it going to be no. not backwards? It will we'll be not backwards. Then. Okay. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about that. Okay? Yeah. Um, all right, so. Um, we're going to talk actually about observational studies. And we're going to talk about experiments. Now, didn't we talk about observational studies last time a little bit? No? I, I te I'm only teaching, I'm teaching three statistics classes. I get you guys mixed up a little bit sometimes. So the observational study is you're going to observe and measure, and you don't attempt to influence. Okay? With an experiment, you deliberately impose a treatment and measure the response. Okay? All right. So I'm going to read you a, um, that's got a bad glare on there. Let me see if I can turn on the slide if that will help. That helps. Okay. All right. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to read you a scenario, and I want you to tell me whether you think this is an experiment or an observational study. Okay? A Danish study kept track of 420,000 Danish cell phone users between 1982 and 1995. They compared the rate of brain tumors to people without cell phones and found no difference between the groups. Okay? So, here, we'll, we'll vote. How many say that's an observational study? One. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. How many say it's an experiment? Okay, very good. That is correct. That's an observational study. Okay? We're not trying to impose a treatment. We're not forcing people to use cell phones, right? Now, um, how about, let's do another one. Researchers want to know if a certain drug cures the common cold. They divide subjects into two groups. Half are given the new drug, half are, half are given the fake pill. The results on who recovers from the cold are compared. Is this an experiment or an observational study? Who says it's an observational study? Nobody who says it's an experiment. Okay, you're all right. Very good. Okay. So. A lot of times, experiments are preferred by scientists because you can control things better. Okay. Problem with observation. I'll put it here. The problem with observational studies. I'm getting my classes mixed up. I don't remember what I told you guys. I'm going to tell you a new story, and hopefully, I didn't tell it before. But if I did, you'll get that answer, right? Okay. So there was a study done back in the 1960s. And they were trying to determine if, um, well, the, the results of the study said that people who eat more sugar have more heart disease. You guys ever heard that before? Okay. There was another study done, and it said sugar has no impact on heart disease. Okay. So we have conflicting studies. Okay. Mark Twain once said, you'll probably hear me say this several times this semester, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Okay? 
So who do you believe? Okay, that, that's always the question. Everything's going to kill you, right? Okay. So the problem was, um, it was, uh, in, in this case, the problem was with what we call a lurking variable. Cause confounding. Confounding. Okay. Lurking variables. My favorite <coughs> definition of lurking variables is what you forgot to include in your study. You didn't know that that was an important thing to include, so you didn't include it. Confounding means the results of two or more variables are not separated. Okay? And you can kind of think of that also as in a case where you've got conflicting results. So one study says sugar causes heart disease, another study says no, it doesn't have anything to do with heart disease. Okay? So what was the lurking variable in this case? Okay, so the lurking variable in this original study, they didn't track whether people smoked. Did you know that smokers consume more sugar than non-smokers? Okay, <clears throat> kind of a weird thing. Why would smokers eat more sugar than non-smokers? Well, just as kind of a guess, smoking lowers your, your body temperature and your muscles need sugar to produce the heat for the contraction, so you need more sugar to produce the heat to bring your body back up to the temperature it needs to stabilize. Okay. That's a really good explanation, but that's not what they think it was. It's good taste type, huh? Good taste. But yeah, well, actually, that, that's interesting. Smoking does dull your taste buds. That, that's true. Okay? So remember, this took place in the, in the 1960s. Did Starbucks exist in the 1960s? No, it didn't. Okay? Back in the 1960s, you had to drink your coffee black, right? Nasty. We didn't have Starbucks back then. Starbucks puts all this sugar in there, right? So the thing is, people would smoke and they would drink their cup of coffee. But because they were smokers and they couldn't taste the sugar, like who likes to drink black coffee straight? There's always one person that thinks about it. Okay, why do you do that? It's crazy, isn't it? You don't like Starbucks? What's wrong with Starbucks? I actually work at Starbucks. Oh, you work at Starbucks. <laughs> okay. I drink their black coffee. <laughs> you drink their black coffee. Okay, well, most people don't like black coffee because it tastes nasty, and so they put sugar in it, which is why, you know, you get the, the lattes and all that stuff, okay? You could probably tell me all the drinks. I, I don't drink that. <laughs> but at any rate, smokers, because they couldn't taste, would dump a lot of sugar in their black coffee. And so it wasn't that they ate more sugar, it was that they drank more sugar, okay? And so the lurking variable in this case was... Smoking was not included. And so the smoking was combined with the sugar, and so it looked like sugar was causing the heart disease, when in reality it was the smoking causing the heart disease. And so that can be an issue with observational studies, is you can't always dis distinguish what's, what's causing the problem here. Okay. Now, if I wanted to determine if smoking really caused cancer, Okay. I would do an experiment, okay? And since you guys are not sitting, you're sitting asymmetrically, here's, I'm going to split the class down here. You guys, you have to smoke. You guys, you can't smoke. Twist my Come back in 30 years, we'll find out who gets cancer, okay? <laughs> that would be a way to do an experiment. Most smoking studies that are, are observational, uh, observational studies because I can't force people to smoke. And especially now that we know smoking causes cancer, it would be unethical to ask you guys to that you had to smoke. It might be even unethical to force you to not to smoke, especially if you were a smoker. Okay? And so a lot of times we have to rely on observational studies because it's unethical to do experiments. Okay? Now, not that experiments are off the hook. 
Okay. I'm going to try. I think I have it in my notes here. Oh, I do. One of my favorite podcasts is called Freakonomics. Okay. You like it? Good it's a good one. It talks all about statistics, but it's always interesting statistics, right? So I've got, actually, I'm glad this is in my notes because I just told my other class about this too. They talk about the problems with experiments, okay? Now, one of the problems with experiments is a lot of times, on the one hand, it, it's good because you can Im impose a treatment. Hey, let's, let's try this drug and see if it works. The problem is drug companies, of course, don't, they have an incentive just to make their drug work, right? And so what they'll do is they'll find the best people where the drug might help out the best, okay? And they'll put them in a group. And then they'll say, wow, this works great. And then they release it in public and it doesn't work so great. For a few reasons. For number one, especially if they're in a hospital, let's say it's a pain medication, okay? you got the nurse coming every four hours. Here's your pill. Take your pill. She watches you. Make sure you swallow it. And then, so you're taking it routinely. You get out of the hospital, is anybody making sure you're taking your pills? No, you go five or six hours, or you just completely forget. And so a lot of times with experiments, they're not natural, okay? Or, the, especially the drug companies, they get people who are it's more likely to work on, get all this success, and then it doesn't work so well in real life, okay? So I'm going to post some of those things. So both of these kind of have problems. They're, they're, they have different problems. But as a general rule, people generally prefer experiments over observational studies. But once again, sometimes it's not ethical to, to, to uh, for one group, for me to force somebody to smoke, let's say. Um, OK, let's talk about some observational study types. We've got, here, I'll just draw an arrow here. So three types of observational studies. Number one, we have cross-sectional studies. Okay. This is where you collect information over a short period of time. Now, one of the advantages to this is they're generally inexpensive. Okay. Now, let's say, for example, I wanted to do a cross-section study, and I wanted to find out how many of you have cancer in my class. Okay. So I hand out a survey. I ask you, do you have cancer? Hopefully, you all say no. We turn it in. It's really easy for me to collect. I've got a cross-sectional study for my Math 1040 class. We're done. Now, tomorrow, you go to the doctor. They give you the bad news. You've got cancer. So one of the problems with a cross-sectional study, because we collect the information over such a short period of time, and when I say a short period of time, it might be a week, a month, maybe even a year, okay? Relatively short period of time. You may truthfully say, I don't have cancer because today you didn't know that you had cancer, but tomorrow you find out. And so you're going to miss some things here with a cross-sectional study. Okay. Another type of study is called a case control study. Okay. With a case control study, they are retrospective. And retrospective means look back in time um, to see differences. Okay, this is the type of study that's often used on rare cancers. And the idea here is. You're looking back in time, and you've got somebody who has cancer. We'll call them the case. Okay? And then you have somebody who does not have cancer. We'll call them the control. 
And the idea is you're going to look back in time and you're going to say, hmm, why does one person have cancer and the other person doesn't? What are some things that they did differently? Well, maybe one of them was a smoker. Maybe one of them worked at a nuclear power plant. So was the radiation. Maybe one of them was a firefighter. I just heard this past week that firefighters get more cancer than the general population. Why do you think that is? Well, the smoke, smoke's kind of the obvious one. You'd think they might get uh, lung cancer, but they get other types of cancer. Well, it's not just lung cancer. Any other ideas? Okay. What they they don't know. Okay. First of all, they don't know. But the, the theory is, well, when you're going into a factory that's got all these chemicals in it, those chemicals are burning. They're getting all this dust and soot on their skin. If they're not washing it off immediately, it's seeping into their system, and that's how they're getting the cancers from chemicals. From okay. burning like buildings that are like from burning buildings. Yes. So. And it doesn't have to be a factory, it could just be a housing complex that has a bunch of you know, cleaning supplies in the basement or something. Okay? Some of that stuff can be very toxic. And so they're, try they're, they're trying to do that, but that's one of the things that they think is if you, know, if you can wash off that soot as soon as possible, that might help prevent cancers. Okay? So that would be an example of a case control study. Why does one person get cancer, one person doesn't? You're going to look back in their history, and you're going to see what, you know, what are what are some differences. A third observational study is what we call a cohort study. Okay, a cohort study is prospective. Okay, which means you look forward in time. Okay. And um, these are really good because you get good data, okay? They can last decades, okay? Because they last decades, they're also expensive. Now, one of the, one of the problems with the case control study as opposed to the, the cohort study if I asked you what you ate for breakfast last week, how many of you can't remember? Okay. How many of you can remember? I can do because you don't eat breakfast. Yeah. Didn't eat anything. Okay. All right. Or the other the other thing is I eat the same thing every day. Okay. All right. So the problem with a case control study is memory is memory not so good. If I ask you about your diet, you're probably going to tell you tell me to eat more vegetables than you actually do, and you eat fewer candy bars, right? Do you mean that for cohort study? The problem with case control study okay. is you have memory problems. Your memory is not so good. With the cohort study, you can get good data because you're tracking it over time. Oh, okay. Okay. So this is the advantage, of the cohort study, but it's also very expensive. I will tell you this, um, one of my professors at the University of Utah told me that um, when he graduated from medical school, he, they enrolled him in the Framingham Physician Study. It's been going on for decades. It's still going on. Okay? One of the things that they would do in this study is that they would send him pills in the mail and they'd say, here, take this. And he didn't know if it was a placebo, a gummy pill, or if it was some real medicine. He said, except for one time, he took the pill, and before he could drink it, it kind of dissolved in his mouth. He said, that kind of tastes like aspirin. And it was. Okay? So one of the things that they did was they gave half of these physicians aspirin, half of them just a dummy pill. They found out that the physicians who had aspirin every day had fewer heart attacks than those who had the dummy pill, the placebo. And so you can get some really good data from um, a cohort study, but they're very expensive to do. Okay? All right. Now, let's talk a little bit about experiments. 
Okay. I'm going to erase this, I guess. Okay, so those are the three types of, of observational studies that we have. With experiments, We'll talk a little bit about experimental designs. Okay? So in experimental design, you have a control group. Control group serves as a baseline. Okay? Often the control groups get what's called a placebo. A placebo is a dummy treatment. Okay, this works really well with drugs because it's really easy to give somebody a pill and they don't know what it is. It could be a sugar pill or something or no, maybe the real thing. It doesn't work so well with surgery. Hey, let's do placebo surgery. We're going to cut open your skin, sew you back up, and not do anything, right? Who wants to sign up for that? <laughs> okay, the problem with that is you can't, you might get an infection. Or how about a placebo diet? I can't tell I'm eating vegetables, right? Kind of hard. It doesn't work so well with uh, with diets. It's kind of hard to have a placebo diet. Hey, it looks like broccoli, but it's really, you know, apple pie. <laughs> okay. So the idea with a placebo that works much better is you're gonna we're gonna do blinding. Blinding is non-disclosure of treatment. Okay? So you don't know if you're getting the drug or the placebo in this case. We have two types of blinding. There's single blind, which means the patient doesn't know if they're getting the drug or the placebo. And then we have double blind. Both the patient and the doctor don't know if they're getting the drug or the placebo. Now, why would it be important for the doctor not to know? Say it again. Yeah, some doctors might be, might maybe they, hey, I got my money in the stock market on this thing, and if it succeeds, I'm going to say you got better even if you do. Right? I'll make money. That can be one issue, but sometimes it's not a nefarious reason like that. But yeah, it's to keep the doctor honest, basically. Okay. There was a study done, and there was one doctor, he wanted to see, it was a single blind trial, he wanted to see if patients did better um, on drugs or surgery on uh, prostate cancer. So let's take two men, tell me your name. Landon. Who is it? Landon. 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 You look like you're an old man. <laughs> I'm really worried about you. You might not tolerate the surgery very well. I'm going to give you drugs. Okay? Let's look. Tell me your name. I'm Colin. Colin. Colin, you're a nice young man. Okay? I'm sorry you've got prostate cancer. I'll well, shoot. Yeah. But I think you're a good candidate for surgery because you're young and healthy. So I'm going to give you surgery, being the young guy, and I'm going to give you drugs, being the old guy. Okay? What's the problem with that? Have better results with the young guy. What's that? You'll have better results. We had, and that's what that's exactly what happened. We had better results, so he said surgery is better because he only did it on the young people, and the old people were on the drugs, and it didn't work as well. Okay, we didn't randomize the treatments, so it's hard to tell: is it really the surgery, or is it the fact that he's young that he did better? So we once again we have problems with confounding. Is age the issue? Is surgery the issue? It's kind of hard to tell because you got two issues going on. Okay? And so that's why 
we try to use double blind experiments when we can so that uh, there's no issues like that. And maybe the doctor had good reason not to give the older patient surgery, but maybe not. Maybe the older patients do just fine, okay? And so that's, that's why we, we do double blinding, okay? Um, all right, let's talk about steps to design an experiment. Number one, you need to identify the problem. And I'm going to say be explicit. Okay? Tell you a true story what happened to me. So, another graduate student I was working uh, at the University of Utah, I had a doctor come to me and she said, Hey, I want to do an experiment and I want to see if. I teach this class, and people uh, do better with their habits, or they improve their habits with respect to skin cancer. And I said, okay, great. You want to see if people do better after this class on people's habits? I said, how do you measure that? She goes, hmm, that's a good question. So let me throw it out to you. How would you measure if somebody did better on their habits with regards to skin cancer? How would you measure that? Like, Tell me your name. Riley. Riley. I'm going to try really hard to remember that. Uh, like whether or not they're taking care of their skin, like applying sunscreen, or whether they're not. So sunscreen? Tanning, like girls. Tanning beds? How long they're going outside in the sun? How long they're going out in the sun? Are you going to follow them around so you can measure with a slap on how long they're in the sun? Yeah, so that's really hard. It's kind of hard, right? <laughs> I mean, that's what you would measure, however, I'm not sure how you measure that. It would be expensive, right? Yeah. I don't think that was in your budget. Yeah. Okay, but those would be some things that you'd want to measure, right? Did you have something? I was going to say, like, how often they go to the dermatologist or whatever, just to get, like, because you get skin checkups, right? Checking for moles and stuff like that to see okay. their percentages. Number of visits there, right? Okay. And she also need to like their skin type, like monitor their skin type, like if they're more their fair than they're darker. Okay, even black people get sunburns, but yeah, I think they do have a little protection, but not. No, they, they can get skin cancer just like white people. Okay. All right, but that sounds expensive, right? Yeah, you, know, you know what she said. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hand out a, a pretest. You wear a hat. You wear long sleeves. You wear sunscreen. That sort of a thing. Collecting papers, I'm going to teach my class. I'm going to have that, that test again, see if people change their answers. What would be the good and bad things about that? What would be the good things? The first test was completely honest. Uh huh. So you could measure if, if they say they're going to do better, right? You could measure improvement that way. What would be the bad thing? Obviously, obviously they're going to answer what the teacher wants. Oh, yeah. I'm going to wear long sleeves in 100 degree weather. Sure. <laughs> okay. People might have good intentions, especially right after the class. After they see all those gross pictures of people's you know, skin cancer ripped up. Okay. So, yeah, the problem is are people really going to change their habits or are they just going to get the answer right on their quiz? Okay. But it would be easy to easy to collect and inexpensive, right? Okay. All right. Number two. Determine. Determine. The variables that affect the response variable. We've talked a little bit about that. Sunscreen, hats, long sleeve shirts, how much time they spend in the sun, that sort of a thing. Okay? Number three, determine the sample size. 
Okay. We won't talk about that too much in this class, but there are uh, equations you can use to say, well, I want to have this margin of error and how big should my sample size be? Number four, determine the level of each variable. So going back to sunscreen, did they use SPF 30 or was it SPF 60 or was it SPF 120? Maybe that makes a difference. Now, curious thing, I had a dermatologist tell me, people who use a lot of sunscreen get more skin cancer than people who don't. Why do you think that is? Oh, I'm safe. I can stay out of the sun longer, right? Maybe it backfires. Or maybe it, it doesn't help. Okay. All right. Number five, you're going to conduct the experiment. And number six, test the claim. Testing the claim, we're going to talk about confidence intervals later in the, in the semester. We're also going to talk about hypothesis tests. That's when the class actually gets fun. And when I say fun, that means hard. Okay? But it's the fun stuff. It's the good stuff. Okay? All right. So let's talk a little bit more about experimental design. Um, there should be some problems in the book, but we're going to first talk about a completely randomized design. Okay. All right. Now, let me just say this. Yes. Sorry, I was just wondering about number six. It says test the claim. I, I just, I test the claim. We're going to use confidence intervals. Sorry, I abbreviated. And hypothesis tests. We'll talk about those. We, when we start talking about confidence intervals, here's your fair warning. That's when the class is going to get really hard. Okay? All right. So completely randomized design. Okay? I'm going to have you guys draw some pictures like this on the homework and on the quizzes and on the tests. So make sure, if I ask you for to do a completely randomized design, what I mean is the first thing you're going to do is you're going to randomly assign. Now, I will say this. It's the step that people always forget. Randomization is your first step, OK? And maybe you're going to randomly assign people into three groups, group one, group two, group three, OK? Now we're going to, in group one, we're going to do some sort of a treatment, treatment A. Let's say we're doing it on plants. The group one has no fertilizer. Uh, group two is going to get the treatment of two teaspoons of fertilizer. Group three is going to get the C thing, and it's going to get four teaspoons of fertilizer. Okay? So then, at the end, we're going to compare our results. Okay? And then, now let's think about this. As we go back to our thing here, we said determine the level of each vector, uh, variable and also determine factors that affect the response variable. So let's, let's talk about plants. What are some things that would affect plant growth? Water. 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 Slow down. Water, what else? Light. Light. Plant food. Plant food, we call that fertilizer. Okay. Carbon dioxide. CO2. The environment. What do you mean by environment? Weather. Surrounding the weather. And it's hard to control the weather. Food. Now, one way you could control the weather would be what? Greenhouse. Put it in the greenhouse, right? Okay. If it's in a greenhouse, they can all get the same amount of water and all the same amount of light and all the same amount of carbon dioxide and the weather's nice, right? What's the problem with the greenhouse? 
not natural, right? So you do your experiment, you find out, hey, two teaspoons of fertilizer is the best for this plant. You go out in the field and you got weeds and rain and maybe rain's good, maybe not, not enough rain or whatever. And so, yeah, you, you kind of created a little bit of an artificial environment. But on the one hand, because you are controlling all this, you're able to say, yes, fertilizer does or does not make a difference. And so that's the nice thing is you can really ice. You hold all these constant, and then you isolate. What's the one issue that I've changed? It's the fertilizer, and then you can say yes, the fertilizer makes that difference. Okay. All right. Let's also talk about a matched matched pairs design. Okay, now with the completely randomized design, it's pretty close. Remember that the random assignment was the first step here. Okay, it's not the first step for the, the match pairs design. Let's say that um, I wanted to do an experiment in which I was testing whether music would help a student do well on a test or not. So the first thing I would do is I would match on gender and IQ, let's say. So I'll pick two men age 22 and they both have an IQ of 110. Or I'll pick two women age 24, they both have an IQ of 110, or whatever, whatever it is, okay? And at this point is when I do the randomization. I'm going to randomly assign a treatment. Okay? So I randomly assign a treatment. Then I'm going to administer the treatment. And then I'm going to compute the differences for each pair, okay? So in this case, pick two guys, both 22. We say, hey, one. I'm going to randomly assign music to one person. I'm going to randomly assign no music to another person. We're going to compare your test results. You both have the same GPA or the same IQ or whatever, and we're going to see who gets the better test result. So one person gets a 75, one person gets an 80. That's a 5% difference. Okay. Now, finally, the last thing I want to talk about is what we call the randomized block design. Okay. With the randomized block design, you have some sort of a blocking variable. Let's say, let's use an example of gender. Now, going into the medical field, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, it is well known that men and women react differently to medications. Back in, uh, it was around 1970, 69, 70, somewhere around there, um, women, when they get pregnant, they have morning sickness. It's not fun. So they said, hey, we've got this new drug. We think it's safe. We're going to give it to pregnant women. Hey, wow, it cures the morning sickness. Oh, wow, we've got huge birth defects. Not cool. Okay? So the drug company said, wow, we don't want to cause birth defects. That's horrible. So here's what we're going to do. Women, you can't be in any more drug studies. We're just going to test the men because they're not going to get pregnant. Okay. Now the problem is we do these experiments on the men for pain or high blood pressure or whatever it is, find something that works. Does it cause birth defects? I don't know. <laughs> is it safe for women? I don't know. Okay. And so that, that can be a big problem. We, we, 
we, we got rid of the breadth effect problem because we didn't want that to happen, but then we haven't tested it, so we don't know if it's a problem. And so that can be a huge problem. So one of the things that we do with the randomized block design, once again, it's, in a way it's similar to the completely randomized design, but rather we're not going to randomly assign first. We're going to block on the men and on the women. So gender would be your, what we would call your blocking variable. At this point, it's going to look very similar to here. With the men, then we will randomly assign to group one and group two, let's say. We'll give them treatment A, treatment B, and then we will compare the results. We'll do the same thing with the women. We will randomly assign to group one and group two, give them treatment A, treatment B, and then we will compare. Okay? So then we can know better. And it's not just medical medicine. Let's talk a little bit about advertising. Men and women react differently to advertising. Maybe we'll put these on Spike TV. We'll put these on the Hallmark Channel or whatever, Oprah's Channel, whatever. Okay? <laughs> And then we'll see, well, maybe we'll use advertisement A for the man, we'll use advertisement B for the women, okay? But the problem is, it would be a mistake to compare the men versus the women because this wasn't a random assignment. You didn't randomly pick your gender, right? Okay? okay? So that would be the randomized block design. All right. So, a couple of announcements. I'm done with chapter nine. Quiz on Tuesday will be chapter nine here in this class. Next Thursday, I did get a room in the library. I can't remember which room it was. <laughs> but a week from today, we will have our class in the computer lab. If you want to bring your laptop, that's fine. Just a quick reminder, everything's going to be on the PC. All your tests will be on the PC, so I'm going to be emphasizing the uh, Microsoft Excel on the PC. It, the Macs are fine, but usually there's a couple little differences, and we can, we can work out that. So. All right, so Tuesday here, quiz on Chapter 9, and your homework you can do that day as well. So see you all on Tuesday.